Welcome, everybody, to a new edition of the Purple Knights podcast. And this time around, I've got Pittsburgh's Lady of the Blues, Miss Freddie. How are you doing, Miss Freddie? I'm doing well. Hi, how are you? I'm great. I'm very excited to be able to speak with you and very honored. I'm a very big blues fan. I don't really know much about the history of it, but there are a few artists that I like. Uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, B.B. Uh, King, yeah, Albert King. Yeah, so, just keep on going. Yeah. <laughs> You're naming the blues. <laughs> so, yeah, I like them all. So, it'll be an honor to talk to you. So, I'm very excited. And you're also a Prince fan as well, which is I why. I am, but I have to be honest. My kids love Prince even more. My youngest, he knows every time um, I'm putting on Pandora, I'll type in, you know, Prince, like an artist. He knows every last song from Doves Cry to Purple Rain, especially when I put on Purple Rain. He's like, Purple Rain. I said, really? <laughs> you know, that was kind of like before you were born. <laughs> so, right, right. And, and my oldest, he and I were talking about Prince last night because I was telling him about this interview. He said, oh, yeah. When du-, He started naming all these songs. I said, oh, my gosh. Wow. He said he, he's a huge Prince fan. Yeah. Yeah. He, wow, he's a great. huge fan, too. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, I'll be mentioning various uh, blues songs that Prince did throughout his career. So if you're not familiar with any of them, I'll send you the links outside the podcast. Okay. So you can familiarize yourself with Prince doing a little blues. Okay. Because he pretty much played a little bit in every genre throughout his career. He was very versatile, very versatile artist. So, um, yeah, and the blues was definitely no exception. He did that very well. But I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about, first, about the the beginning of your career and how you kind of got started. And Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, you know what? Actually, as a kid, I started singing with a couple neighborhood friends. We would pretend, you know, we were singing in front of, like, doing a concert, and we were just, you know, it was a couple of us. We were just singing to each other, but we would pretend we'd sing the audience, and then um, at 15, I joined a church where I lived at in the area and um, started singing in the choir. Then time went on, kept singing in the choir, different churches I attended, and then in 96, that's when it really started. Um, I was dating a bass player and he heard me sing the song Silent Night to my youngest, who was a little thing back then. And uh, he said, I didn't know you could sing. And I said, I didn't know that I could sing either. He said, well, we're looking for a singer. It was a blues band. And I'm like, (laughs) you know, so he convinced me It, it didn't take much. And I went and I auditioned for the band. And then next thing you know, I'm in my first organized professional band, Blues Music Works or BMW, headed by Big Al Levitt. May he rest in peace. I mean, he was a blues man. That's all he loved was blues. And it's like, wow. I mean, he um, he had toured it one time, he told us, and he met Pine Top Perkins. He was saying all these places he'd went. And, you know, it got me interested. And, you know, I kept singing and singing. And then I ventured off 2002, 2003 to form my own band, Blue Phase, F-A-Z-E. And as time went on, I have two bands. Actually, I have three now as of last week. But the first two bands was Miss Freddie's Blues Band and then my acoustic home cooking band. The acoustic band, we do blues, classic rock, and some gospel. The electric blues band, we do blues. Kind of like a Chicago style um, with a Miss Freddie twist on it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, the acoustic band sounds fantastic. And I was going to mention, um, it's funny enough, you have your roots singing in the church because a lot of, a lot of great singers started out in the church and singing gospel and stuff like that. And it's interesting you mentioned that because listening to your music, um, in preparation for the podcast, I was struck by how much you reminded me of 
Mavis Staples. I don't know how familiar you are with the, the Staples singers, but big names in gospel music. And of course, Mavis in the late 80s and early 90s collaborated with Prince quite a bit. So you remind me quite a bit of Mavis. And that's a big compliment coming from me because I love Mavis and one of my best friends and I talk about Mavis quite often. We adore her. So I just wanted to mention that parallel and your your voice is definitely up there in the Aww, upper echelon of, of blues and soul and gospel singers. So um, yeah, it really struck me, really resonated. So thank just, you. And and I'm from I'm very familiar with the staple singers. Um I actually do a couple of their tunes and I love Mavis, you know, she, uh, when I listened to the staple singers, like in the younger days, the, you know, back in the seventies, um, right. growing up in eighties, I could always distinguish her voice out of the group, which is the weirdest thing to me. That was back then. And then when I listened now, I said, yep, that's her. Um, cause she dabbled a little bit, you know, not only the gospel blues, jazz, and, um, collaborated with a lot of different artists. So I love Ma Mavis Staples. She's, um, she's fantastic. I love the Staples singers. They were one of my favorite groups growing up as far as if I wanted to get into, you know, the whole gospel thing, I would listen to them. So that is a compliment. That is a high compliment. <laughs> I am very humbly honored by that. Thank you. Well, thank you. You're your talent is uh, very, very evident, and it was very enjoyable listening to your music, uh, preparing for the podcast. But um, so in 2010, you released your first album, That Kind of Woman. And uh, tell us about that experience. That was an experience. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that that was the first time me recording um, my own CD out of Bone Dog Records in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, under Jeffrey Engelsall. He's a great musician. Um, he produced it, and uh, a couple songs were written by him, and then the rest by Mike Sweeney. And I tell you, I did not realize what it took to record in the studio. I was excited. Um, before it was released, I got to listen to every single song I did. And it represents, it represented me, that kind of woman. There's a little bit of jazz, rock, blues. Um, there's some blues country in it. Um, you know, there's a little bit of one song that I love that I want to redo called Habit. It reminds me of something Billie Holiday would do because I love Billie Holiday. Oh, nice. Very I, nice. I love yeah, and so, but that song, Habit, I did 30 takes of it. And at the 30th take, I said, this is it. I'm done. If this doesn't work, I don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, th they took the, the last take. I said, oh, my gosh. Um, so a, a lot went into it. Um, I was very excited, you know, to do it. And. I'm very honored and blessed that between Mike Sweeney's um, writing, and he still writes for me, and Jeffrey Ingersoll, you know, taking a chance, um, out came that kind of woman. So it was exciting, but it was trying. Excellent. <laughs> well, then, then I'm sure you brought that uh, knowledge and that experience into your second album, which came out in 2017 it's your latest full-length album um you have a couple singles out there we'll mention those as well in a bit but um lady of the blues in 2017 what was that like recording that, that? Was, oh well you know i went in there um with a little bit more experience from um from what i did the first time uh, -huh. uh what I liked about recording the second time well first of all I was very very nervous because um well I I had never been to California I'd never met Kid Anderson I'd heard a little bit about him and he's a guitar player with uh, Rick Estrin and the Nightcats and um 
I got a taste to listen on YouTube before I went out there. And I'm like, oh, wow. Kid is really a skillful guitar player. He is like a monster guitar player. He's great. And my friend, Brandon Bentz, who was originally from Pennsylvania, um, lives out the West Coast. And we were introduced to, um, to each other by a mutual friend here in Pennsylvania. And she said, you know, I got somebody, you know, you really like, good friend, great musician. And so Brandon, you know, he asked me, hey, are you thinking about another CD? I said, yeah, but, you know, I just can't get myself off the ground. I don't know where I want to go with it. And that's when he mentioned Andy Santana, also out there in the West Coast, um, Andy Santana and the West Coast Boys and Kid Anderson. They both co-produced the CD. And so it was done in three and a half days. The studio musicians that Kid, um, you know, he got for the uh, CD, they were heavy hitters, but they were the nicest people. They have played with and anybody from Etta James to James Brown. So, oh, wow. Oh, that's what I said too. And I said, <laughs> I got to step up my game because, you know, Kid was about, you know, he, he didn't know me. He had never heard me. So, you know, one day we were sitting on outside on his porch and he's playing acoustic guitar. I said, yeah, I'll just play one, four, five. And he did. And I just started singing something. He's like, you can sing. And I'm like, well, you know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So he heard something in my voice and his wife, Lisa, she's amazing. She's another musician also herself in her own right. And she's got a beautiful, incredible voice. And so she was giving me some coaching because I've never had vocal lessons in my whole entire life. Never. Wow. So she, she was trying to, you know, coach me. And, and a lot of, a lot of things I took, you know, back home once I was done with it. Um, But I had decided, okay, these are heavy hitters. They're down to earth. But, you know, we are not here to play. This is a serious thing. And it was pretty much like eight hours every day, three days. And, uh, you know, a couple of songs on there. I just said, you know what? I need to switch it up and just have fun. Home Improvement is one. (laughs) Because if you listen to Home Improvement, at the end of the song, Kid is is talking and there's there's a couple other people and so he kept that on there and he's like that's what I'm talking about (laughs) I said okay um (laughs) so it it was fun but I learned a lot because these are people who not only are used to touring but they are also used to being um you know session musicians and they were great and made it it, I was much more relaxed and comfortable, although I knew there was like a time crunch. So, um, yeah, that's that's what that was like. It was exciting talking, you know, talking to them. It just it was really nice to talk to down to earth musicians. Yeah, it must be great as an artist to be surrounded by great people and great musicians like that. I mean, it's so it sounds so uplifting and. And Prince was one of those people, too, that would uplift people. I'm learning more and more about him since he passed. Um, A little background on me. I've been a fan of Prince since I was three years old. Wow. Uh, I'm 41 right now. So um, I literally grew up with Prince as the soundtrack to my life. And, um, but I've been learning about him since he passed through books and podcasts and things about how he, um, took the musicians around him and the singers around him and elevated them, uh, yes. pushed them outside of their comfort zones and yep. ele- lifted them up to the point where they could do things that he knew they could do, but they themselves didn't even know they were capable of. So it's, it's so wonderful and transcendent for an artist to be surrounded and inspired by, you know, fellow musicians and singers like that. So that must've been a tremendous experience for you. Uh, but I wanted to ask a little bit about, um, so we get to 2020 and we're dealing with the pandemic. Uh, what's it like 
as an artist with two bands to sort of navigate um, the pandemic times last year? Well, well, last year I only ended up doing four shows. Um, the, the first one I did was a week before we got locked down back in March and it was at Children's Hospital. Um, but then there was three more and one was in the big theater. And there was only 40 people and I was fine with that. And the other two were outdoors, but, um, and I didn't do any more shows after that. Um, it made me, first of all, you know, I work full time as a nurse, so, um, but God, it may. God, God bless you. We need more health professionals. Oh, I have, thanks. I, I was born premature three months and I'm yeah. in a wheelchair with cerebral palsy. Okay. So I've dealt with a lot of doctors and nurses in my day and I have such a tremendous appreciation for everybody in the medical fields uh they're they're you know overworked and underpaid so god bless you for doing that work oh thank you you know thank you very much you're very welcome thank you um and so i didn't realize until i started um performing out this year again how much i missed performing in front of live people. And I tell people, now, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about I'm Zooming or I'm doing a virtual, I've recorded a video, which I've done um, a few of those. I said, it's not the same. The interaction is not the same. Yeah, people will like, you know, if, they're, if you're doing a uh, Facebook live feed, um, but it, it's, it's definitely not the same. Um, so when I started performing out, I realized that I was so sad and I must have been depressed and I just kind of didn't realize it. Um, and it taught me a few things too. First of all, I went and bought a flute because I used to play the flute as a teenager when I was in the um, high school band and up until like my oldest was three and that was a long time ago and I stopped. So, and then I started reading music because I taught myself to play acoustic guitar as a teenager. I still have my acoustic guitar that I've had almost 10, 15 years. I just, you know, every now and then I'll just pluck. So I, I bought things to enhance what I do as a musician. Although I just, I sing. Um, I bought books about music, reading, you know, uh, reading notes, reading um, the theory because I've never had, as I said, any lesson of any kind. Um, and it taught me that I appreciate the people who come out and hear what I do. I am always one, and, and musicians out there, forgive me, I love you and I love what I do, but my whole thing is what I do is, um, what I do is not for me to keep. It is not for me to be selfish with my music, meaning, I'm not gonna sit at home and, you know, sing to like my four walls or the family or, you know, to the birds. I want people to experience what I do because every last show that I've done in the last 10 to 12 years, one, at least one person, if not many, have come up and said they could relate to what I'm singing, a certain song that I sang my whole mannerism and I tell people it ain't about me getting up there looking pretty you know and being sassy and fancy I said really I can be sassy and fancy at home <laughs> I said it's about me grabbing your attention because I want you to stay at least for my first set and make sure you go back and spread the word about Miss Freddie and her band it's like wow you know Miss Freddie really put on a show and you know I've had people, you know, come up and tell me, you know, you were singing to me. I know there was other people out here in the audience with me, but I, I knew you were singing to me and that's what I want. And I know a lot of musicians, you know, they, they feel that way, but I tell people it's this energy. And I really missed it when we had the lockdown, we couldn't go out and perform. I truly missed it. So what I do, I tell people, I say, I'm not trying to be morbid, but every performance since I started back singing out now, I 
perform as if it's my very, it's going to be my last performance. Yep. That's yep. how I look at it. Yep. And no matter I, if I don't feel good, I'm angry, no matter what my disposition, it ain't about the music because the music makes all of us feel good. Right. Right. And I, I want to go off the a little bit and just say that in my opinion and in my experience, there's nothing more spiritual and more uplifting than music. Music is, I think, is the purest form of connection to the divine that there is. So when you're in that flow, you know, for me, talking about myself as a spectator, um, there's nothing I love more than live music and live bands and singers. And it's just, uh, you know, a very spiritual experience for me because it's very, it's very uplifting. And like you say, that connection and that energy, um, there's nothing like it. So yeah, what, what artists, what musicians and singers provide is something that's way beyond the music itself. And I really do resonate with that. And I would say Prince is a great example of that because he was a very phenomenal once in a generation live performer. And you could just tell how he fed off the energy of the audience and felt the love and the appreciation of the audience and gave that back to us. So I know exactly what you're talking about, Freddie, when you talk about that connection and how important it is, not only to the musicians and singers, but also to the spectators as well. So yep. I would, personally speaking, you know, not to sound selfish and talk about myself, but I would love to be able to come out and see a show. Uh, I'm in Minnesota. But uh, if I ever make it up to Pittsburgh or anywhere in Pennsylvania that's close, I will definitely come out and see you because just hearing you speak and hearing, you know, a little bit about who you are as not only a person, but an artist as well. Um, I'm very inspired and very touched by you and your story and the things that you do. And I would love to be able to experience that for myself. So, oh, gotta get, got, got, gotta give that to you. <laughs> that would, Thank that you. Would, that I would don't be know how wonderful. Far is, how far is the state of Indiana from Minnesota? I'm not good with geography. I'm terrible I, with geography. So I'll I would, be in the state of Indiana doing a festival next month, um, as long as everything is okay and, you know, doesn't get canceled, you know, no right. lockdown or whatever. But yeah, but if I'm ever, ever out in um, Minnesota, you know, I'm crossing my fingers, um, you know, I'd love to go out to the Midwest, you know, period and yeah. perform. I'm hoping um, yeah. definitely will keep you in mind. Um, or, you know, if you can't make it, it'll be like a shout out. I was like, guess who's here? You know, <laughs> right. right. So, Right. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I wanted to I wanted to mention too that um last year, in spite of the pandemic, you released a single, a cover of the classic Wade in the Water. So tell me a little bit about that. What was that experience like? Uh it was a surprising experience because I had never released a single. Um, I had always thought about it, but I figured, oh, I'll just do the album. But uh, it, it was a wonderful experience and it was very unique. Um, a gentleman out of Ohio, he's a musician, singer, songwriter, uh, Mike Morgan. He uh, contacted me because a promoter out in, he was looking for someone to do, to sing a spiritual gospel. Well, I thought he was doing an album and just wanted, you know, some vocals, but here that wasn't the case he was looking for a singer to do a single, put their name out there, you know, and then just, you know, the sky's limit. Oh, and wow, so he got cool. a hold of me. Yeah. Yeah. So whoever the promoter was, thank you so much. And uh, Mike, um, 
new, he's a very talented musician. I never had heard of him until this project happened, Jay Vernali. He's out of Nashville, Tennessee. He's very, he, he's very skillful and soulful. And um, I got to talk to him a couple of times. We emailed back. And then uh, they added some a background singer, Kim Parent. She's out of uh, Nashville. She's amazing. People, you know, when you listen to it, they're like, wow, that choir behind you. I'm like, wow, you know that it could be one person dubbing their voice over and over again. Um, but it, it was amazing. And I, uh, they, they put together the instrumental, sent it to the studio that I went to, um, tr uh, True Image um, here in, um, it's in Pittsburgh and uh, Hollis Great House. Thank you, Hollis. Um, they sent it to him. I went in, I did like several takes and then Hollis, you know, we sat down. He's like, no, oh, I like this one. I'll send it to, you know, to the guy in Nashville. And that was it. And, and, and that time I felt I was a little bit more experienced and having, and I've recorded for Hollis um, before in the past, like I've used his studio here in Pittsburgh. So, and he's a musician himself. Um, he's very talented. Uh, so um, it, was, it was a very blessed spiritual experience to me. And so when Mike finally sent me the finished product and I listened to it, I cried. I, I couldn't believe it. They didn't change my voice. Because one thing about me as an artist, please do not change my voice or tweak it because how I sound in the studio is how you should hear me out in public. And um, nobody tweaked my voice. And I have to tell you, I, I, I cried for a few minutes. I couldn't believe it, you know? And I sent it to a friend of mine. I said, you gotta listen to this. This is unbelievable. And, you know, um, Mike wanted me to find a spiritual, you know, that hit home to me. And I told him, you know, wait in the water. Cause I remember, as a four-year-old, when I first started going to church in Sunday school, I heard a choir sing Wade in the Water. And I remember that as a four-year-old. And that song has always stuck with me all those years. So that's, it, it was a great spiritual experience. I loved it. Wow. That's wonderful. And uh, yeah. So, wow. I'm just sort of thinking about it. And yeah, the, the ability of music to to spiritually reson resonate, you know, and bring you, bring you to tears. It's happened to me a lot of times listening to music. Like I say, I really believe that music is the purest um, divine channel. And I really do believe that. So that's, that's wonderful and remarkable. And again, you're working with such great people you know i love the way you talk about them and the enthusiasm you talk about them with and and it's it's so great to to connect with people that can you know work with you really well and sort of elevate your own abilities and your own performances uh it's such a blessing so oh, yeah absolutely it's I, I love musicians, you know, everybody that I've worked with so far, even um, as a guest vocalist on local musician CD, um, I've been doing too. They challenge me. Um, and especially when I did my own work, I, I was challenged. And, you know, I love being challenged. And I tell people, no matter, I, you know, if I like all of a sudden become frustrated and it's like, ah, oh, you know, um, continue to challenge me, but then, you know, you can tell me, okay, why don't you just take a breath? Why don't we just come back another day? No, I want to do this. If I say that, just say no, 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 because you did tell me I could say that. And, and I love being challenged because out of challenges, I tell people, you, you get to learn, you get to have the experience and you get to learn so that the next time, if you're given the opportunity to do whatever project you're doing, it just doesn't have to be music. Um, You'll get to build on that. So always, always, if you're challenged, it'll, it'll keep you going. It'll keep your spirit um, lifted. At least that's for me. Um, and it'll make you want to like keep doing, keep going, 
you know, moving forward. Are you going to take two steps back? Probably sometimes. Is it going to be all the time? Probably not. But that's not for you to stay behind those two steps. So it, you know, I, I love, now I love going into the studio. <laughs> right. I, I love it. Yeah, it's, it's a cool thing to do. It, it truly is. Right. Technology is a beautiful thing. Right. And you were talking about challenges from the standpoint of being challenged and motivated as an artist, but I can bring that, I can resonate with that in my own life because I've always told people that I've viewed my disability as, you know, I have viewed my challenge, my physical challenges that I've had in my life as blessings in disguise because they really do um, push you to rise above and be your best self. So, and I've, for years, I've struggled with low self-esteem and really struggled with loving myself and accepting myself, but I'm finally awakening into the the kind of person that I always knew I could be and your, you know, your view of, of life being, you know, challenges being valuable, you know, learning lessons. I think that's what the meaning of life is, you know, um, at its most essential core is to learn and to grow through struggle and challenges because that's how you really that's how you really find your strength and your purpose is through those struggles and those learning moments so i really resonate with that and then this year your latest single is something to believe in right yeah so tell me a little bit about that experience what it was like recording that um that was very challenging <laughs> uh thank you brian cole for challenging me i love you for that <laughs> but he's a he's a great musician and a great producer um i went to michael stover um my publicist uh mts management and you know when, when i originally i should have made myself a little bit clearer <laughs> I was looking for somebody to, it's like, I, I need somebody to, like every time, you know, I, I have, like I bring a song to you, you know, you know how I sing, you know, let's make it a, you know, what Miss Freddie does. Well, Michael introduced me to Brian and I remember Brian from an open jam session some years back. So um, he, he kept telling me, he said, I have this song, I think you can do it. It's like when people hear it, you know, it's going to, you know, make them believe. And I'm like, oh, OK. So I finally went in the studio a couple of times and I recorded. And the last time I went in was um, I think I went back in February, March. I think it was March of this year. And I did several takes. It was driving me crazy. <laughs> but I was listening to myself and I said, no. And I get it. They try to tell you, well, for sure, studio is like a throw environment, meaning that, you know, it's just you and the technology, the engineer, your producer. Yep. Um, it's not like live. And, you know, um, he and the guy in the studio, the engineer is like, pretend there's people. I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> I said, the only person I pretend that's in the audience is me because that's how I get over my stage fright. And I said, it's not the same. But then I started thinking about my mother passed away in 2015. She had two different kinds of cancers. Um, and I thought about how it not only affected me, but my siblings and my nieces and nephews. They still miss her to this day, a lot of them. And I said, maybe I can do this with the thought, this is a tribute to my family, you know, a tribute to my mom. And so that's, you know, that's what I end up doing. I end up, you know, as if I was singing to my family, you know, this is our mom coming through me, 
going out to you through this song. So it, it was tough um, because I had to become very emotional, you know, when I recorded that song. And um, when the final, when it finally was sent to me before it was released, once again, I cried. I couldn't believe it. I, I just couldn't believe that was me. They didn't tweak my voice, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just couldn't believe it. And I said, not only is this going to help me and my siblings, it's going to help a lot of people on this planet. Um, and so I sent it to one of my friends. She's a great musician, Queen Delphine, um, out of the state of Indiana. She's a great blues singer. And um, her husband had passed away of COVID last year. And she was doing a memorial, like a celebration of his life the month of May and she listened to him and she's like do you mind if I use this for the celebration I said absolutely you go right ahead and she let some other people and um, they asked who was it and um, they told her she told them who I was and you know I I'm glad um, and I've been singing it out with both of my bands and now I have a gospel band so the gospel band and I, they, they, we have to learn it as a band, but my first two bands, and I tell you, people come up and um, they find it very pretty. And I tell them, you know, um, I'm going to do it this Saturday because if I had my mom been alive, that Saturday, you know, she in her birthday. So sorry, I don't want to start crying. <laughs> well, I... I, I First of all, I'm sorry for your loss, even Thank though you. even though it's been several years already, but I know I I can't speak from experience. But because I've I both of my parents are still with us, but I I can only I I mean I can't even begin to imagine what a loss of that magnitude is like. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, and no, that's fine. Thank you, though. It, it, it's, it's fine. I'm okay. I think it's the nurse in me. Because throughout my nursing career, I have seen things. I've worked in trauma, worked with patients, you know, stood by patients, held patients hands as they, you know, they've passed away. So, yes. um, uh, you know, I think I'm more so I feel and it's probably not the right thing to say, but sorry for my siblings and my nieces and nephews because of that pain, because our mother was that strength, the matriarch. Everybody went to her with their problems and questions and anger, you know, so right. she was pretty much the sounding board of the family. But thank you, though. Right. Her, and by the way, my mother liked Prince and I didn't know that. Oh, wow. That my, I did not know that. There is a song. I forget what song he did. Oh, I got to ask one of my siblings if they remember. But I found out, um, no, she was still alive. And I'm like, because I think the radio was on or something. And she's like, oh, that's Prince. She's like, and I'm like, really? You know, and I just kind of blew it off. So I, you know, and I, and that, and that came to mind. So I'm going to have to ask my siblings what song, because there was a favorite song she loved that he did. Now, I think that was the only one, but I don't know what it is, but yeah, she was a Prince fan. I was shocked. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, when you, when you find that out, you're going to have to let me know, because now I'm curious. I'm curious too. I'm going to ask my brother, because my brother was more so. Um, well, probably my, my one sister, because our other sister had passed away four years ago, so she might have known. But I have to ask my brother if he remember, you know, I'll ask both of them, maybe my one of my nieces and nephews. But, you know, it's kind of a shocker because my mother loves blues where she loved blues. That was her thing. Growing up, that's what I had to listen to. I had that choice. But yeah, yeah. Um, my siblings like, you know, Prince, like I said, my kids like Prince. So you know, um, but I love it when my youngest, because one night um, I found a Prince album on YouTube and I, I think I was doing some homework. This was a long time ago when I was in school. And I just started playing Prince because I couldn't think, like I couldn't figure out the problems. And then uh, he started singing. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm like, what does he know about Dove's Cry? And then, the, um, you know, uh, the Corvette, and then kissing and I'm like wait a minute what does he know about this it was a funny it was so cute because he was like 
um, let me see, when I was in school, blah, blah, blah. So he had to have been, he's 29 now. It was a long time since I was in school. Um, so he had to be like late teens or something because my, my youngest is on the autism spectrum. So music, oh, he, he knows a lot of different artists from way back before he was born and then up until now. And I think his favorite artist, because I used to let him listen to a lot of music, was James Brown, Prince. Um, he knows some Michael Jackson and average white band. Oh, yep. He yep. is like all over the map and he knows their songs. I'm like, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's but yeah, great. he he yeah, my family, yeah, my my kids like Prince. I, you know, that's cool. Prince was very entertaining because I remember there was um oh the Super Bowl. He I said hands down. He's like my first favorite when he did the Super Bowl one year, halftime. Yep. I mean, that show was just absolutely fantastic. Oh yeah. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, first of all, I've lost five pounds watching him because he's just moving too much for me. <laughs> I said, second of all, who plays like that? Who plays guitar like that anymore? You know, all that energy. And um, he was very entertaining. I tell people that's entertainment. Yeah, he had all the lights and the hoopla and all that. But I said, if you watch him and look at his other things that he does, he's consistent with entertaining right you know there's right. no five years ago say if he was alive today five years ago you know he if if you've noticed every year every two three years he's consistent but it's gotten better as far as entertainment and right. i'm like he was entertaining i i super that was my like one of my favorite super bowl halftime shows oh definitely mine too and it's we're we're pretty biased, but as as Prince fans, you know, we rate it as the the number one halftime show of all time, of course. But we're we're pretty biased in that respect. But um, yeah, I mean, like you say, just the energy that he had and the the showmanship, you know, it got better. Yeah, in the later half of his career, even so. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, well, to close things out, I just want to do let let you um tell everybody where they can find you on social media and online and stuff like that. Well, you can go to my website and uh, check out my bio, my music. You can find on Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Amazon, CD Baby, YouTube. Add me to your playlist. That would be so wonderful. I appreciate you all. And uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. That sounds so great. You uh, froze up a little bit there. So let me uh, let me state it again. It's MissFreddy.com, right? Yes, uh, that's my I website, yep. M I S S F R E D D Y E. Yep. So it's like the man's name with an E at the end. Um, so I'll put that link in the description box on YouTube and also Blog Talk Radio and iTunes. Um, Spotify, I'll put that link as well okay. to your artist page nice. and also your your twitter as well okay so, perfect yep so if find anybody, me all over the place if anybody wants to follow miss freddie and see what she's up to you'll be able to click on those links and it'll take you right to it so um freddie thank you so much for joining me tonight and i just want to say it's been a pleasure and an honor to talk to a person and an artist such as yourself, I'm oh, so glad we got the opportunity to connect. And I hope we can talk, continue to talk outside the podcast about music and about 
spirituality and about life because when I meet special people like you, I definitely want to maintain contact for as long as I can. So um, absolutely, absolutely. And I'm just not saying that I tell people, you know, you know how to get a hold of me. If you know, if I need to reach out to you, I know how to get a hold of you. And I am very honored that you had me on here. I, I, you know, I, and, and I'm talking to somebody that's like a Prince fan for real, right. <laughs> not just somebody who listens to his music, you know? Um, right. So it, it, it's an honor. I, I am humbly honored and I thank you so much. I really do appreciate what all that you do, you know, and I, no challenges for you, I don't see. And, you know, my, me- my takeaway message is I tell people and it goes for you too. Don't let nothing or nobody drag your spirit down. Yep. Yep. That's a good note to end on. So on behalf of myself and Miss Freddie, I'd like to say thank you for watching. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on blogtalkradio.com or iTunes through Apple Podcasts, thank you so much. We appreciate you. And until next time, this is Chris Johnson. See you later, everybody. Bye.